Doc, I don't, I really don't think it's that crazy a thing to say. Yes, sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 206 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, as always, joined by Bryson and Jacob. We've got the gang of all three of us back together again, finally. But it's not the series we wanted to be talking about. The Blue Jays lose their eight-game winning streak. They lose their streak of winning series. They drop a three-game set to the Minnesota Twins. Jacob, Bryson, how are you guys? Good. Good to good to have you back, Mark. Good to have us three back. Uh, yeah, it's the first loss since the May 13th to 15th series, I believe, when the Jays were in Tampa. So, I mean, other than that, they've been cruising along and they finally kind of, you know, you can't win every series going forward. But at the same time, since that series loss, the team has continued to play a lot better. However, this weekend in particular didn't exactly go as planned, but uh, that's OK. Short memory and they move on now to their upcoming road trip. Yeah, and I just want to clarify one thing. Um, I said this in the last episode. Turns out I read the Twins record wrong. They were not like seven games under 500. They were seven games over 500. So, you know what? It was a good series, I think, overall. Like a good series in terms of competing overall. Could have been better. I know we'll get into this. It easily could have been a two out of three if the first inning of today's game could went a little bit differently. But like you said, short memory. You go on a road trip, you face the Royals, who going to make sure I say this correctly, are a terrible team. Uh, so let's hope that series goes a little bit differently. Short, short memory for you, Jacob. I also <laughs> destroyed you in fantasy, so I understand. Okay. This is not a uh, fantasy podcast, so we're not going to okay, talk about that. Well, we, got, we got that out of the way early, thankfully. So enough of the fantasy slander. Um, yeah, it sounds like the aggregate opinion about this series is that it kind of sucks in the moment, but it's not that big of a deal overall. Like you look at the silver linings of this and there is a big silver lining the silver lining is the fact that the blue jays are still hitting the blue jays had their best offensive game of the season on saturday in that 12 to 6 or 12 to 3 win um the offense is still going the bats are still there the performance is there even if they did get a little bit unlucky if you want to call it that in the first inning of today's game on sunday and you know kind of bleeding into the second and third innings but um on the aggregate i think the opinion is it's not a huge deal because the blue Jays have silver linings that they can rely on. There's other things that they've got going on that are overall positives and will hopefully and probably carry into this series against Kansas city. Oh, hundred percent. And I think first thing is Kevin Gosman, his line kind of looks ugly from just the face of it, but three and two thirds innings is what he's been, you know, officially given three earned runs in that, in that frame. Not great. But at the same time, there were two balls that could have been or should have been caught in the first inning of today's game were not caught. I think you're still seeing what Kevin Gosman can do. And his splitter, you know, it was doing what it did. Like the the Twins hitters weren't swinging at it. I still think you don't change the game plan. Obviously, you know, he's been locked up for five years for a reason. He's a good pitcher. Jose Barrios, another good thing. 13 strikeouts, which I believe is a new career high for him. Like that was a good thing in this series. And as you mentioned, the offense, you know, you're seeing it pretty much from everybody. Teoscar Hernandez, uh, you know, people are getting going. Uh, you're seeing Bo Bichette with a couple of home runs or, you know, a couple of big moments. Bo, uh, Kevin Vigio with a big moment in the first game, I think it was, or in the in the second game. But one of the games, he had a big hit. You're seeing Alejandro Kirk, Santiago Espinal. Everybody's hitting, it seems like. And really, what I find interesting, again, is the Blue Jays are going back to that DH having that DH spot be occupied by a catcher, which not a lot of teams do, which, you know, I understand why, because if you lose the DH, then you're kind of in a a little bit of a pickle. But I think overall it was a good series. The team, you know, you don't want to lose two of three to a team or really any team, but I think overall you score three runs in the first game. Ideally you score more than that, but when you can score three or score 12 and then six, I think it's a good series. And especially if your offense, you know, it's doing well. Defense has been, except for the first inning of, of the Sunday game, it was pretty good all season long or all series long, all season long, whatever you want to call it. And the starting pitching, again, you say Kikuchi got in a little bit of trouble. Kevin Gosman got in a little bit of trouble in the first inning. Both of them rebounded and had good starts. And going forward, I think we're seeing, as we'll get into, Ross Stripling makes the start tomorrow against the Royals. 
We'll see Manoa uh, Kikuchi. So yeah, Stripling Manoa Kikuchi back into the rotation against, you know, not a great team. I think it'll be a very interesting series. And as long as the offense can do what it's keep doing, it's not even like we're relying on it getting better. It's been good for now a couple series. And I think Bryson, you and I said this last week or, or last episode that we needed one more series to see how it would do. And it, it did exactly what we expected it to do. As long as you can get what, what you've seen in this series over more series or, and more games and whatever, I think it will be a lot, uh, a lot more exciting of games in the future. Yes. So you go back to game one and this is pretty much the, oh, obviously the opening game of the series. You got Yusei Kikuchi pitching. He wasn't great. Something that we, you know, we've seen the previous two starts before this, where he was pitching a lot better and he's just giving up a lot of hard contact. And again, he hasn't been dealing with this past two starts, but it was pretty much, you know, a thing where he wasn't fooling a lot of twins, uh, his primary and secondary pitches. They weren't getting a lot of, I guess, whiffs at all, which was this fastball and changeup. So that game as well, you have the offense pretty much being a little bit flat, just four hits. And really the only runs that contributed from there were just, uh, Vladdy and Springer home run. So those are pretty much the only big uh, moments from the game offensively there. Another thing that I kind of took note of, Mark, I know that you mentioned this in the Discord chat that we have, is that Trevor Richards still doesn't look right. Uh, He ran into more trouble on Friday night. A little bit of a concern that remains with that part of the bullpen just because he's one of the late inning guys that the Jays always kind of rely on dating back to last season. I think over the course of the last two weeks, his ERA is at or he has an ERA of six and that's pretty much in six innings of work. So everything's inflated. He's walking guys, there's trouble. And that's pretty much only the takeaways from, I think game one that we had. And obviously game two was a much better showing Jose Brios, Jacob, you already touched on it. He was fantastic. I mean, he's coming off in may where he had an ERA, I believe it was seven Oh one. It was actually worse than what he had in April, but that's due to a few starts here and there that where he really allowed a lot of earned runs, which inflated that ERA. And I kind of, find it very similar to his start against the Mariners on May 17th. But of course, this time he was striking out a lot more guys than he did in that start. And you also mentioned it, the, the career high in strikeouts that he did record, his stuff was dominant. And it was really also a bizarre start to his outing because it just felt like it was going to be another short day for him. Uh, he allowed two runs in the first, I believe Jorge Polanco had a two run home run off of him right away. And then through his first six batters face, he had three strikeouts, which was good. But on the other hand, he had three balls in play over hundred miles per hour. And those all resulted in hits. So it was kind of a weird mixture where, he was striking guys out, but then when the twins made contact, it was like really fast. And of course, hundred miles per hour, they were hitting him hard for those first few innings. And then after the first, he settled down completely and he didn't, I believe he didn't allow a hit beyond the second inning. And then he retired 18 out of his last 20 batters. So he really, really settled down. And this is what we need from Jose Brios. There's no question. The stuff is there, but the consistency has been the problem this year. And the 13 strikeouts were a sigh of relief also because of the concern about the low amount of strikeouts that he's had uh, throughout his previous starts. We've always kind of been talking about it. He's just, there's been a lot of solid contact, even when he managed to pitch a lot better than what he did compared to a few different outings. So you had that, you had the offense responding really well with 12 runs on 16 hits, Bichette, Kirk, Vladdy, they all homer. And it was also the 12th time of Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s career where he homered on consecutive days, which was Friday and Saturday. And then Alejandro Kirk, I mean, he remains pretty much the top of conversation with this offense uh, at the top of the leaderboard. I believe now among catchers in MLB with WRC plus it's just showing how valuable, not only of, I guess, of a hitter throughout the rest of the league, but of course, among all catchers, it just shows how valuable he truly is being at the top of the leaderboard with catchers over that. And of course, over the last 15 games, I think he's got a batting average of 432 OPS over 1300, four home runs, nine RBIs. It really continues. And Jacob, another guy that we managed to talk about near the end of last podcast was Kevin Biggio. He's a guy that still is playing really well since being recalled from AAA Buffalo. And um, since returning from AAA, he is batting 286 with an OPS of 893 with three extra base hits. And he's already, he already has more walks in June than he did in April and May. In April, uh, it was less. And in May, it was less. But I'm talking about in total in June, he has more walks than what he did in April, all of April and all of May. Those are separate, though, if you know what I mean. And he had 12 plate appearances so far in a or in June. Sorry. So the offense itself, it's been pr- pretty much proving continues to prove that they are getting going. Uh, I think pretty much over their last 19 games, they've now scored 97 runs and that's compared to 58 runs in the previous 18 games before that. So the home runs have also doubled. The signs continue to be there, which is why Jacob, 
you're now on board with us because I was sold last series. Mark was sold last week, which is great. Game three, we talk about game three today. One of the weirdest starts to a game, I think, with Teos Hernandez and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. having trouble with the sun in the first inning, pretty much leading to three runs out of the gate for the Twins. And then with Kevin Gosman, there is a whole lot to talk about with Kevin Gosman. So you kind of touched on it a little bit, Jacob, in terms of the Twins not exactly chasing at his stuff. And I think also a big impact that Mark and I were talking about as well is that the first inning he had completely threw him out of rhythm. And it was pretty much his second consecutive start in which he was battling his stuff on the mound. Um, not a lot of hitters have been fooled, especially with the splitter. And it's not like his stuff has been bad. The stuff is there, but the difference is, is that nobody's chasing at it. And you can even go back to the May 18th start against the Seattle Mariners. Something that I also took down is where it felt very similar in terms of he was pitching fine, but the strikeouts just for some reason dipped out of no, for no reason. And I think at that start, he finished with three strikeouts and there was really no whiffs as well in his fastball that start. And then he only had five on a splitter. And pretty much if you want to look at it from previous starts that he made in April when he was pitching really well, he would have around almost 10 whiffs on his splitter alone. So it would be double what you pretty much saw that start alone. And the, the White Sox start was very similar. And then credit to Joe Siddle, who, Mark, you pointed out in the chat uh, of how good he has been on the broadcast. He really began a really, I guess, lengthy conversation about Kevin Gosman's stuff. And it pretty much came down to if maybe he was tipping his pitches somehow, maybe there was a sign that he was given to the Twins of a certain pitch he was throwing, which maybe explains why all of a sudden, randomly, just the Twins weren't swinging at his stuff. And it's just, you know, you... you pretty much what he was explaining was that when he was releasing or when he was in the middle of his windup, he would pull back his hand and the, you, you would be able to see his hand, which means you can see the grip and then you can see pretty much what the pitch is going to be. So when you put this all together, uh, Gosman stuff again has been really good, but the starts I mentioned are just bizarre in terms of hitters all of a sudden not chasing. So perhaps the idea is true. Perhaps there's some sort of sign that he's giving hitters, that they are catching on to and pretty much twins hitters today only swung at six out of 19, uh, six out of 19 of his splitters, which is 32%. And the case that Siddle did make was that he got, or the, the case that Siddle made is that, and there was even more traction as well. Cause Luis Arias, I don't know if you guys met, saw this on Twitter, but somebody pointed out when he did get to first base after he got on base from Kevin Gosman, he waved his left hand up uh, pretty much to his helmet, to the twins dugout. So if that's not a sign that they, picked up on something I don't know what what else is so I, I also believe near the end of Gosman's start he stopped using the splitter in general so this is completely you know legal what they were doing uh the twins in terms of I guess relaying messages to their dugout but it just shows that there's something going on with Kevin Gosman in terms of his wind up or his mechanics that are affecting I guess you know just pretty much spoiling almost what is going to be at the plate which is a lot easier for hitters to know what's coming at the plate. We talk about it all the time. When you know the pitch coming to the plate, it's going to be very easy to put runs together. So he's got to clean that up. I'm not concerned. I think it's just a few things that he's got to look at on video, but he's definitely got to clean it up. And you definitely, and once you do that, I think you're going to go back to kind of what we saw early on in April and pretty much for the most of May where he was fooling guys with the splitter. Yeah, I definitely think there was something going on. And when someone, as smart as Joe Siddle picks it out and points it out and talks about it on end for 30 minutes. And he literally said on the broadcast, there was a pitch. I don't know who it was to, but it was a perfect splitter was right at the bottom of the zone and the hitter on the twins laid off it. And at that moment, Joe Siddle said he was convinced that the twins had something on, um, on Kevin Gosman. And if someone that smart about baseball is convinced about something you got to take his word for it like to be honest that's not something I'm I have enough baseball IQ to pick up on just watching a pitcher pitch but you could tell even towards the end of the outing for him where like you say he wasn't throwing a splitter at all he, he just turned to the fastball like he knew that something wasn't working and that's what it came down to so yeah I, I mean it's not a point of concern because I think as easily as the twins figured that out and as easily as Joe Siddle figured it out on the broadcast, I'm pretty sure Kevin Gosman realized halfway through that start, the Twins had something on him, and he stopped throwing the splitter. So I know that the Blue Jays are going to be spending the next four or five days working on that if they haven't already discovered a fix already in his windup and in his delivery. So it's not something I'm concerned about writ large. It's just something that I found incredibly interesting watching that game. And to be honest, if it didn't hurt the Blue Jays so much, I would have enjoyed it even more because – 
that type of thing and Joe Siddle on the broadcast, uh, just so, so phenomenal. So much knowledge about baseball. And there was another moment later in the game, a throwing error. Um, I believe it was in the ninth inning. It was what Danny Jansen hit a ground ball to the left side to the shortstop. Looked like it was going to be a double play to end the game. Um, he picked up on, I mean, the, the obvious part of the play was a throwing error by, I think it was the second baseman over to the first baseman that gave Danny Jansen an automatic base over to second. But instantly, Joe Siddle picked up that the shortstop had double clutched the ball. The ball had hit like the heel of his glove. And that's what caused the second baseman to speed up his throw. And that's what caused the errant throw. And I, I don't know, Joe Siddle, like his analysis is incredible on the broadcast. I know that's not the point of the conversation we were having, but just watching him, he's, he's brilliant. And I want him to be on the broadcast every single day because I enjoy it so much. And we used to get it on the radio side of things. Now he's doing pregame stuff. I want him back play by play or color somewhere, somehow. Don't know how it'll be. Don't know when it'll be. Don't know how consistent it'll be. I just want him on the broadcast because fantastic analysis. Anyways, that wasn't the point of our conversation. We were talking about Kevin Gosman. Sounds like we're not altogether too concerned because they've already identified what's going on. We already know what's going on and it's something the Blue Jays are going to fix. Um, something that you mentioned is Trevor Richards. And I think that is something that I am personally concerned with. He just hasn't been himself lately out of the bullpen. And we know this can happen with the pitcher. There can be something mechanically, something that hitters pick up on, like is the case with Kevin Gosman. It's just concerning to see him struggle, especially when the Blue Jays bullpen is at a point of, I guess, vulnerability. Um, you know, Tim Meza being on the IL, guys like Trent Thornton being in the majors, guys like Jeremy Beasley being in the majors, guys like Ryan Barucki getting their final chances with the Blue Jays and being shipped off elsewhere. The bullpen is at a position of vulnerability and, uh, the fact that Trevor Richards, who was previously a stalwart in the, this bullpen, is struggling is concerning to me. As a 5.32 ERA on the season now after a fairly strong start to the year. So that is a source of concern and gets back to a conversation we were having a week or two ago about how the Blue Jays might want to explore going out there and looking for a deal for a swing and miss guy out of the bullpen because – Right now, their bullpen isn't all that deep. Deeper than it was last year? Yes. It's just not all that deep compared to some of the other competitors that they're trying to catch, namely the New York Yankees at the top of the AL East. Oh, 100%. I think, especially with Trevor Richards, I probably more than I should have said the core four in the bullpen all throughout last offseason, whether it was uh, Romano, Simber, Meza, Richards. Meza's on the IL. Richards has kind of struggled lately. It's, you know, when you have two of those four really doing what they're expected to do and what they're supposed to do, it's not looking necessarily great for you. But I think the biggest thing here is, well, there's two things here. One, you're subtracting Ross Stripling from the bullpen, so you don't have that guy that could take up innings or and just in the, in the bullpen in general. Like, you could put him in any situation and he'll take it. But if you're talking about additions to the bullpen – Nate Pearson, hopefully soon. I think, you know, you're talking about swinging this guy. I know ideally you want him in your starting rotation unless he absolutely cannot start and then you put him in the bullpen. But if he's in your bullpen, you bring him in there. I think he's, you know, in, I think he's probably, you know, a swing and miss type of guy in that type of situation because I compare him to a Roldis Chapman, but just throwing from the right side of the infield. Or, or from the from as a right-handed pitcher, he has you know similar fastball. He's got he's got a breaking ball. You know he can. We saw him. You know even in his first start in 2020 against the Nationals, he struck out. I think it was Trey Turner in his first at bat off of a fastball. He can blow the ball right guy buys, right got right by guys. I think we'll see you know so, <laughs> something like that where he easily is that swing and miss guy. Now obviously this is down the line and this is, you know, a lot of things have to get into that or have to factor into this. I wouldn't be surprised if he's somebody that at least for the extent of Hyunjin Ryu's injury stays in the bullpen when he comes back, or maybe they switch him in Ross Stripling. I'm not entirely sure, but 
if you're, you know, if you're Trevor Richards, look at what happened with, with Ryan Barucki, a guy that's been with the Blue Jays for what, maybe four or five seasons at this point. You know, he's definitely been here since 2018. He was there before the rebuild, during the rebuild, after the rebuild. And he just, you know, it, it wasn't working for him. And the Blue Jays, you know, they shipped him off. Obviously, you, you don't want to see that happen to anybody. You want to give them another chance, but it didn't really work for them. I'm not surprised, or I wouldn't be surprised at least if Trevor Richards, you know, if, if this does continue, if something doesn't happen or with, you know, if, if something happens where he, he gets moved over, because unfortunately a 509 ERA on the season, it just doesn't cut it. And, you know, the thing is, is when you're a reliever, that ERA is, I think a little bit more indicative of your performance, because if you're a starter, you could have like one six or seven inning shutout and that could really improve your your era like look at jose Barrios. he had a third of an inning in the first game of the season four and runs i think were charged to him so that obviously inflated his era but if you're a relief pitcher when you're only throwing maybe two or three at most innings a game or every you know two or three games that's really going to impact your numbers and i think for trevor richards it's just that's what it is you know earn runs he he didn't allow an earned run on June the 5th against the, the Twins, but two earned runs on the 3rd, two earned runs on the 31st of May. Uh, you know, he's just consistently allowing runs. You know, he'll have stretches where he's good, but then he'll have stretches where it's just multiple earned runs charged to him. And you can't have that in the bullpen, especially if you're only going to throw one inning or or maybe two innings you're, or you're charged with one batter. And you're like, okay, you need to get that batter out. It just cannot happen, I think. And, Yes, it's early. I don't, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but every single game counts. We saw this last season. The last thing you want to do is have, you know, earn runs or relievers or, or any position player or any area on the field uh, costing you games early in the season. But for Trevor Richards, I'm not like, despite what I've just said and despite how I've kind of said that I think he's on the chopping block, I'm not fully fully concerned i think he definitely will turn things around or at least i I give him the benefit of the doubt to turn things around i just think that benefit of the doubt is starting to run out and if it's a if it's a rough first couple weeks of june then i think we'll definitely need to see some type of move it's for me it's concerning just because of you know you know his role coming into this year his role last year like this is a guy that's very heavily relied on and then when you take that out Sure, you know, you have David Phelps and thank goodness for a guy like David Phelps who's pitching well, because thank goodness that you don't have this issue um, without everybody else. You just have this issue right now with somebody uh, in terms of a late inning leverage that we know of, like Trevor Richards. So David Phelps, uh, it seems like, you know, over the, I guess the past like seven days, it feels like they're really reverting to him more and later later on uh, than Trevor Richards and rightfully so. I mean, I think David Phelps, an ERA of 1.17 over the last seven games that he's appeared in. So it's been really good for him. You're missing Tim Meza. We mentioned that, or Jacob, you mentioned that. Uh, It sounds like he's going to be on a rehab assignment this week, and then the hope is that he is back with the team in Detroit next weekend. So that's good that you have reinforcements. Uh, You brought up Ryan Barucki, uh, who unfortunately, just his tenure didn't work out here near the end. And for somebody like Ryan Barucki, as much as, you know, you you don't feel bad in a way, or you're kind of sad just because this is a guy who came up through, I guess, MLB pipeline, And then he, you know, it just felt like he was going to have a very promising career with the Jays. He was given many opportunities, opportunity after opportunity. It's not like there was no playing time for him here. This was a guy a couple weeks ago that was pretty much pitching, you know, late in the game. We we spoke about the St. Louis Cardinals uh, appearance that he had. And then, of course, there was different opportunities that he also had coming out of the bullpen. And for a few games, he was that first guy that they reverted to for the lefties because Tim Meza has been unavailable. So, You figure that you're going to lose them on waivers. So the Jays try to find a trade partner before that even happens. Uh, I'm completely fine with who they got for him. Uh, And and I think Tyler Keenan is who they got for him. So that's fine. You got something out of him. And now you really wait for somebody like Tim to come back. You have Andrew Vasquez back or with the team right now. We know that once Tim is back, you're not going to be relying on him likely late in games uh, every single time. But again, with Trevor Richards, Jago, I think you pretty much, you know, we're pretty much spot on with it. It just, I'm concerned with the, I guess the contact he's allowing. And the other thing too, is he's allowing a lot of home runs. I think it's six or seven home runs now that he's allowed. So this guy, when he gives up hits, he's given up 
home runs and it is serious damage. This isn't something where he is allowing traffic and he's working out of it and he manages to escape the jams. Like this guy gets into trouble and then it completely falls downhill. I believe he's in the bottom of the percentiles in terms of barrel rate as well. Like everything about the stuff and the contact that he gives up is truly, uh, I guess it's just, creates a lot of damage for the Jays. And then I'm also mentioned it too. He's walking a lot of guys. His stuff is just completely wild right now. And you need Trevor Richards to figure it out because again, he was brought into this Mark. You were talking about it in terms of the moves. Maybe they make it early this year. We don't know when they make it, but this was an early move as well. They did last year. And this guy was brought in to fix those problems, to be there late in games. You like David Phelps. You like the way he's performing, but you'd be so much better if you had Trevor Richards pitching just as good or a lot better than what he's pitching right now, because then that gives you depth. That gives you options. And right now you really don't have options. We know that the bullpen's pretty much been running on fumes a little bit lately. It seems like they're getting better now. Somebody like Jordan Romano is a lot pretty much rested up. I don't think he's pitched at all in the last couple of days, a lot in terms of appearances. And then, you know, you're trying to just fiddle in guys who are healthy in terms, or I should say, well rested. And then you, you just don't have a lot of options, which is also why guys like Trevor Richards, no matter how bad he's pitching, sometimes they have no choice, but to throw him in here because that's all you have. So he needs to figure it out um, or else I don't know how much longer in terms of a leash you're going to give him. Uh, you know, it feels like they're slowly, you know, when they can, they're lowering his leverage in turn uh, but again you might have to sometimes throw them there late in the games and we've seen that over the past couple of weeks but they're also trying to when they have the chance to you know pitch them earlier in the game you know just try and figure things out maybe put put him there for a little bit he can figure things out so it's just the bullpen we know it's been at work a lot this year which is why guys uh have pretty much had to pitch no matter who you are it's very relatable to ryan barucki uh julia merriweather is another guy who's been struggling but sometimes the jays have no choice but to throw a guy like Merriweather into the game because again, people have been working, you know, a lot and you can't be pitching people back to back to back, you know, in terms of that. And then you have Jimmy Garcia as another guy who can pretty much has been pitching a lot better uh, when he's getting a day of rest. I think i read the splits to you guys about a week ago. So it just shows that. And it goes back to the point that they need a swing and miss guy. They need another guy um, because of the struggles that you're getting from someone like Trevor Richards. But this is a guy that you rely on and he's allowing a lot of damage he's allowing a lot of home runs and you really don't know what's wrong with him like this has been a thing where he had a I guess a mediocre April I think his ERA was around four and then it really fell off the rails from near the end of May which skyrocketed his ERA pretty much to now and then to start off June it also hasn't been very good so he's got to figure it out there's definitely concern because that's a guy that you really rely on and we'll see what happens in terms of if they can figure things out, if he can figure it out, or it'd be also interested to see what, else, you know, what, what other options they do. You mentioned Nate Pearson, Jacob. I also asked you the question throughout the absence of Hunjin Ryu. Do you think that he maybe sneaks into a start or two? And I think for now, he's obviously going to start in the bullpen, but that's also an option that you're getting as well as he's currently still in AAA Buffalo. So you have some internal reinforcements, but we, we've been mentioning it too. And Mark, you mentioned it right at the top. It's not deep and you really don't have a lot which is why you feel like it's inevitable for them to eventually make an external move and trade for somebody. I will say the one thing that's encouraging right now is that despite how we're talking about how the Blue Jays bullpen isn't deep, a lot of the numbers on the periphery do look good. So while we're talking about guys like Julian Merriweather who are kind of forced into these games where they shouldn't otherwise be pitching because of the depth isn't there for the Blue Jays, his ERA looks bad. It looks ugly. It's 6.32. But you look at some of the other numbers, especially FIP is what I'm looking at right now. Trevor Richards is the only guy who's getting regularly into games with a FIP above five in the Blue Jays bullpen and even a FIP above four in the Blue Jays bullpen. Because even someone like Julian Merriweather, 3.47 FIP. You look at Trent Thorne, 3.21. Ross Stripling, 3.3. And then whole bunch of good numbers from Simber, Garcia, Phelps, Romano. The only guy that has an ugly FIP is Trevor Richards. So if that's any sense of consolation for future performance, of course, FIP attempts to take out some of the luck factors that we know exist in pitching and in baseball. If that's any indication of future performance, that's a little bit of a consolation. Although I still think the Blue Jays do need that Swing and a miss guy. FIP isn't perfect at predicting future performance. We know that there's going to be some volatility there. So, yeah, if, if that's any consolation, 
in all of this, it is a little bit encouraging, but again, you do have these issues that still exist with the bullpen. Um, okay. Before we move on, I do want to talk about Alejandro Kirk, but before we get to that, I want to let you know about DraftKings. So DraftKings is new and in Ontario now. Um, it's officially arrived. You can legally bet on all your favorite sports. That's MMA. That's hockey. That's playoff hoops. The NBA finals going on right now. I don't know what the score is of game two. Celtics Warriors, Warriors. even the series. Oh, they Domination. won. Nation. Okay. Celtics wow. and six. Wow. Okay. Well, Jacob, I'll tell the you Warriors. right now, you both can go bet on Celtics and six or the Warriors and Warriors and six, Warriors and seven. Around there, possibly. Give me an answer. Seven. Okay. So Celtics and six, Warriors and seven. You guys can go bet on that with a DraftKings Sportsbook. Um, they got special parlays. They got spreads. They got money lines. Um, and, of course, you can also bet on baseball if you're not a big basketball person, if you're not a big hockey person. Um, you can do it now anywhere in the province. Join the action. Download the app and explore everything DraftKings Sportsbook has to offer. They also have a bunch of impressive features that include same game parlays, select a game, combine multiple bets, like which team will win, goals scored, more for a shot to win big, um, safe, secure, and reliable. So get excited, Ontario. DraftKings Sportsbook is live. Go to the App Store and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now to get in on all the action only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call Connex Ontario, 1 866 531 2600 19 plus. Physically present in Ontario. Eligibility restrictions apply. See sportsbook.draftkings.com for details. Please play responsibly. DraftKings operates pursuant to an operating agreement with iGaming Ontario. So I mentioned I want to want, want to talk about Alejandro Kirk because as we've mentioned earlier, he is right now one of the best catchers in major league baseball offensively and obviously we know what his defense has been it's proved a lot he is a top catcher right now so what do you guys think the ceiling is for him um can he take playing time away from danny jansen how do the blue jays balance the playing time equation if he keeps playing like he does is there a chance he's an all-star catcher? Is there a chance he wins a silver slugger at the catching position? What's the ceiling for him? And how do the Blue Jays manage the playing time between him and Danny Jansen? And eventually, it's going to become a question, Gabriel Marino, is there a trade coming up soon for the Blue Jays with Alejandro Kirk or Danny Jansen or Gabriel Marino? What's the situation like? How do you guys view it moving forward? Well, first of all, about trades... Alejandro Kirk, I think it's fair to say that he is not an untouchable for this Blue Jay team because whether it was Francisco Lindor or uh, Jose Ramirez, Jose Ramirez, it, he was, you know, he was mentioned in those trades. He was not by any means untouchable. I, if he's doing well, I think any trades on the books for the Blue Jays, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens, but to be fair, you could say that for a lot of other guys. You could say that for Gurriel. I think, you know, he he and others were named in trades and they were guys that, you know, are doing well and we'd expect them to be regulars. But I'm going to hold off. I know you're talking about Alejandro Kirk. I know he's hitting 307 on the season. I know he's slugging for 471 on base percentage, just a little bit below 400 at 389. Like, it's it's good. You know, he has, he has over the course of a season, like he's doing well but I'm going to give him a little bit more time because we mentioned, I, I think I mentioned at the start of the episode, he's DHing, you know, quite a bit in the, uh, you know, throughout the last couple of weeks with Danny Jansen getting a lot of the playing time. He obviously as Jansen is more of an offensive catcher. Kirk is more of a, or excuse me, more of a defensive catcher. Kirk has more of an offensive catcher. However, with Danny Jansen, he's also, you know, not necessarily playing terribly, you know, he's hitting 241 on the season. So yes, not as good as Kirk, but better than what we've expected and what we've seen out of Danny Jansen. I just think that, you know, if you're Alejandro Kirk, I, as much as I love what I'm seeing, I I'm going to say, I'm going to need a few more weeks to see what we truly get out of him because 2020, I'm going to kind of not really count that. Obviously we saw a lot out of him that season in terms of like good numbers, but it was very short sample size last season, not terrible, but 
you know, not obviously you can't expect a guy to hit 500 over a whole season or else, you know, you might as well call him the greatest baseball player of all time. But it was like, it, it wasn't what we had necessarily expected. 2022, I would say he's, he looked good. He's looked good over the last couple of weeks. And unfortunately I dropped him in fantasy right before he picked it up and I can't pick him back up because somebody else did it, but that's, you know, a different story. I'm just saying, I want to hold off a little bit, see what he's able to do against the Royals. I think the next series after that, we'll have to see what, uh, you know, what he's able to do against that. I think it's against the Detroit Tigers. So again, not, not a crazy good team. We'll have to see what happens there. I, 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 what I'm trying to get at is, see what we see out of the month of June and then make a proper assumption out of him or a proper expectation out of him. Because June, first of all, that's right at the cusp of the all-star break. And when teams are going to start selecting representatives and when voting is going to go in, I think we give him the rest of June to really prove himself, see what he's truly capable of. I know that's only half of the season, but my point is, is as good as he's been so far and trust me, like obviously as I'm, I'm mad that I dropped him, but, as a player for the team that I support, I'm happy to watch him do this well. I just want to see at least a couple more weeks or, or at least a couple more series, if that makes more sense. A couple more series against a couple teams. See what he's able to do. See what he's able to do consistently. Is he going to get more defensive playing time because of his offense? We'll have to see that. Or is he going to be more of a, uh, of a designated hitter? But I'm happy to see what he's able to do for this team so far. I just, I, I want to see at least at least 10 more days, like at least like a, you know, call it an IL stint, but like not an IL stint, at least 10 more days of this type of performance before I truly, truly make an assumption on them. Well, I can tell you one thing. That's why you're in 12th and the guy who has Kirk is now the first place team. So just we're not giving him about weapons. That. Go ahead. We are but not yes, discussing that. This, well, if you put yourself in a coffin with that. Anyways, uh, Alejandro Kirk is it's just it's a great situation to have because we spoke about this coming into the year. The catching situation is always intriguing. Like it has been an intriguing thing on Jay's Twitter, like through those dark days of the lockout through the year, even last year at some points, just talking about how this is always something that they're going to eventually need to address because Mark, you talked about Gabriel Moreno, but right now you're enjoying the moment with what they have. You have Danny Jansen, who is as well. We can't forget who has been offensively at his best so far in MLB, which is really good. You have him, you have Kirk, and it's really a good mishmash they're doing right now. And this is a guy on Alejandro Kirk who played a lot during Jansen's absence. And it was really, we, none of us really knew how he'd respond because he, bar he barely has a lot of service time uh, in the big leagues. And of course it's a guy who's never consistently played every day. So you had to be cautious with him there. I think as much as there were certain categories for him where he started off slow in April, he was always hit like having or hitting for average. And he was always, I guess, hitting relatively decent. And then the thing that was holding him back was the extra base hits. Everyone was talking about how it took so many plate appearances for him to finally do that. He gets that done. And then now you see the power starting to show. You see the OPS rising. You see the slugging percentage rising. And you were talking about a mark in certain categories. He, among all of baseball for catchers, he is pretty much up there um, in terms of tons of categories. If you're looking at OPS, if you're looking at home runs, I think really only the only guy that is pretty much doing better than him, who is, I guess, played a lot of games. Uh, you can look at William. You can look at both of the Contreras brothers, one in Atlanta and one in Chicago. They are both pretty much uh, playing really well. And William, or sorry, Wilson Contreras on the Cubs has played just as much as Kirk has played around 46 games. So, you look at them and they are really pretty much leading the way in terms of that, in terms of offense, the OPS is there, the home runs are there, the RBIs are there. Uh, I was talking about the WRC plus earlier. He's pretty much up there with Contreras. Uh, so you look at those, you like it, the ceiling for him though, Mark, it's, it's hard to say because I don't think we expect him to be this good consistently. Like at this level, we know that there's going to be, you know, some cold spells. We know this, but relatively he is a good hitter. Like he is a, a lot better than I think what we saw in April, but you know, to say that he's going to keep this certain pace up for the entire year. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I think it's really a really good part of the offense. And it clearly is. I mean, in terms of catchers all around, I mentioned Jansen too. Like this is a position that they are pretty much at the top of the big leagues for you look at batting average too. Alejandro Kirk's, I think his expected batting average. Everything is pretty much in terms of, you know, these types of numbers are at the top 
of uh, the leaderboards in baseball. And the other thing, which is so precious these days, is the strikeout percentage. He is the 98th percentile, and we mentioned this already, but he is at the top of the leaderboard in terms of striking out. This guy does not strike out often. He knows when to walk. He knows when to lay off. He knows when to swing at the right pitches in the strike zone. That is why he's so hard to get out, even going back to April when he wasn't hitting for a lot of power he's just difficult to get out of. So you look at that, you guys are kind of throwing in the all-star twist there. He's among a few surprises on this team that I don't think we ever predicted to be an all-star to potentially have the option or the, or I should say the opportunity to start in the all-star game. Another guy you look at is some, somebody like Santiago Espinal. These are both guys that were kind of under the radar in terms of, we didn't have these all-star predictions for them, but both of these guys have a legitimate chance to start. I'm not just to be a reserve, but to start in the all-star game more, maybe Kirk, I would say has a better chance at starting, but both of these guys, just to make the team in general, it's a really good chance for both of these guys. And you love it. I mean, this is a great problem to have, you know, now, and this also takes the pressure off of somebody like Gabriel Moreno. Let him develop. Let him take his time through AAA. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you were looking at it and kind of saying, you know, how much longer are we going to keep him down here before they have no choice but to make this move? Danny Jansen was hurt. It was just Alejandro Kirk. Zach Collins wasn't hitting the ball well, and he's been optioned to AAA since. So it just felt like the Jays were getting to that point where maybe they had to, you know, force their hand to make a move. But now you can sit back. You can relax. Both Jansen or Kirk, knock on wood, are healthy, and both are hitting the ball really well. But Kirk in particular is leading baseball, leading catchers. He's at the top of these categories, which is insane. And I don't think any of us really predicted that. Of course, we all know he's a very good hitter, and he's going to remain a good hitter. So I don't know if we've yet to see his overall ceiling. But in terms of this current pace, I think it's safe to say he's not going to keep it up at this certain rate but he can definitely be just as good or if, you know, you, you know what I mean in terms of good throughout the rest of the year. I think he's really figured things out since the calendar flipped over to May. And as we progress into June, I'd take everything both of you said, but when July 28th, 29th rolls around the blue Jays phone, Ross Adkins phone is going to be ringing off the hook with requests from GMs around baseball asking, is Alejandro Kirk available? Is Danny Jansen available? Is Gabriel Marino available? Because the Blue Jays have what is so incredibly rare in baseball, and they have a depth at catcher and an offensive depth at catcher because, you know, there's defense galore all around baseball. Having a good offensive catcher is so, so rare. So that moment is going to come, and when it does, I think the Blue Jays are going to trade Alejandro Kirk or Gabriel Marino. I think it's going to happen. Uh, I I mean, you guys look shocked. I I really don't think it's that crazy a thing to say. Look, when it comes to Gabriel Marino, last year we saw the Blue Jays are willing to part with top prospects if it means they improve their team for this year. And to me... Gabriel Marino is no different than Austin Martin and is no different than Simeon Woods Richardson. If they're willing to part with those guys for a guy like Jose Brios, I see no reason why they wouldn't be able to or really wouldn't be willing to part with Gabriel Marino for someone like, I don't know, Juan Soto is the only name that's popping in my mind right now. I know the GM of the um, of Washington said they weren't trading him, but that's the only name that's popping. But like, if there's a big name guy like that who they are looking to get to improve their team now, I don't think the Blue Jays will hesitate to trade Gabriel Marino because they're in a win now mode. Same thing with Alejandro Kirk. We haven't totally seen it. We haven't totally seen them move major league talent yet to improve the major league team. We kind of saw it with the Randall Grishik trade, but I think they're willing to move Alejandro Kirk if it means filling in another role that they need, whether that's a lefty bat whether that is another all-star starter, whether that is a high-impact reliever, although I don't think they would move Kirk for just a reliever. But point being, I think they have such strength here. I think by the time the trade deadline comes and goes, one of these three catchers is going to be gone, except Danny Jansen. I think Danny Jansen is untouchable. And I know the offense might not be totally comparable to what Alejandro Kirk offers, but The Blue Jays clearly since 2018 have given such lead up and such time and such dedication for Danny Jansen to be a catcher at the major league level. 
and it's finally paying off. And I think the reason why they've given it so much time is that they believe wholeheartedly in him, not just offensively, not just defensively, defensively, but what he does off the field as well and what he does with this pitching staff. So bottom line, by the time August 1st rolls around, one of Gabriel Marino or Alejandro Kirk is not going to be a Blue Jay, in my opinion. You guys might think different, but to me, I can say that with 100% certainty today that one of them is not going to be a Blue Jay. See, the only way that I see Gabriel Marino not being a Blue Jay, and you brought up a very convincing argument, how they parted ways with top prospects. I was furious. I'll be honest. I was furious (laughs) when they traded Austin Martin. I'm not so mad about it now. Regardless of Barrios' numbers this season, when you you have – eight plus seasons of Barrios now, including the extension. I think that's a a W trade if you're the Blue Jays, but I don't know. I I highly, highly doubt they're going to trade a a top prospect that is a catcher, but my point point stands that there's not, you don't need all three of them. Like one of them is normal. Fair enough. I I think Kirk is fair game to get traded anywhere because, okay, well, yeah, I, I you know what I think he's fair game to get traded anywhere. I like, but if you're going to trade Gabriel Marino, the only way I see this making sense is if you trade him for Ramirez or Juan Soto. I know Ramirez is kind of off the chopping block because he's just signed that like what five year extension. Don't remind us. Oh yeah, fair enough. But I like the way that I see you trading Gabriel Moreno is if you get like the top of the line player, not just like at that position, but you get like the best player in Major League Baseball. I, maybe that's Juan Soto. Maybe, you know, obviously it's not Lindor. That's not Ramirez anymore. But if it's Kirk and you need, you know, Matt Chapman for, for another season after after 2022, maybe you want to get, I don't know, a new third baseman or, or you know, any you want to get a new starter. I don't know. But if you're Alejandro Kirk, it's almost like a blessing in disguise because no matter how well he does for this team, it's either he helps his team win or he helps his team win by getting new assets and I wouldn't, you know, I, obviously I like Alejandro Kirk. I've, you know, I've mentioned that he's, he's a value valuable player and, you know, both on the field and off the field types of uh, types of situations, but I wouldn't be surprised if he gets traded. I'll be completely honest. And I've said that kind of all off season, the last maybe two off seasons when we mentioned the Lindor rumors, I think he's on the chopping block, but for the best possible reason, just because of how good he is and who knows how likely a trade is. Like, you know, we always mention that maybe guys will get traded. If it's a trade this big, you know, involving Kirk, possibly Guriel, possibly top prospects. I'm not entirely sure how likely it is. We'll have to see, but well, if you can get Juan Soto, you trade for him, no matter what the situation is. But if it's as big a trade as this, it'll basically i don't know like that things like that are very unpredictable that's like the type of thing that ken rosenthal just breaks to you out of absolute nowhere but i don't know it's a good problem to have it's a good you know thing to have right now if you're the blue jays you're doing well you've obviously you lost the series against the twins but you're doing well overall over your last two or three series or even four series i think it's a good thing to have you have your dh as your catcher you have your catcher who's also doing well who can also catch and do well defensively if you're the blue jays you ride this wave as long as you can yeah i i guess what um i went like i reacted how you said that mark i i don't i i agree that it's going to be addressed at some point i do i just i don't know if it happens like i don't know if they really need to do it 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 all depends on who's available like once we get a better sense of what the market will look like i think i'll have a better answer yeah like i will like that's my I guess my one caveat to say okay, 100% okay. certainty. Like, okay, that, that makes more I, sense. I think it depends on where the Blue Jays are as well. They might be in a situation where they don't need to go out and make that big deal or they're already, God for God, let's hope not, but they might be in a situation where they're already out of the playoff race and they aren't making a big deal like that. But those are the only caveats, I would say. Yeah, it's tough because we know – Gabriel Moreno like we know the hype he has and then he's currently in the minor leagues Jacob you were talking about it last year with Austin Martin how at first you weren't exactly sold on it but now when you look at it you feel a little bit better about it it's just that's the problem we know this that's the problem with prospects and all that you just don't like we know the hype they have in the minors 
if he can you translate that at MLB? I don't know. But with Kirk, like you see, we've you were talking about it too, Jacob. There's been so many rumors previously where he has been, I guess, brought up in these discussions. There was also uh, the there was a deal with the Pirates, or there was a trade talk to the Pirates a couple of years ago where he, where he was also kind of the centerpiece for that, um, where he's been involved. And there's always been league wide interest in Alejandro Kirk. That has never changed. It just I don't, I I was just, I was talking about it earlier. You know, you have a guy who walks a lot. He doesn't strike out a lot. You don't see that a lot in terms of baseball anymore. Those are very impressive tools. Now that's why as much as I would probably say, if you go back to February or you go back to spring training where we were saying, yep, Alejandro Kirk, that's probably my guy that I'm training right now. I think I'm more skeptical about moving him than I was back in March. But I, again, I do think they're going to make a move with one of those three. All I'm trying to say is I think in terms of Kirk playing the way he has been, I just, I'd feel very skeptical. And I just, again, it all depends on the market, but I just feel, I would feel very skeptical about him. Now, what does that mean? I personally probably am more, more willing to trade someone like Moreno right now. That's, I know that's definitely a little bit of a different thought than you guys. I just, you've seen him translate this at the MLB level. I'm always skeptical with how prospects turn out. It's always, it's not always hit and miss, but relatively with everyone, it is the only issue is Moreno, I guess of how much he's really been hyped up down in the minor leagues. It all depends on how big of a splash you're going to make. If you're trading for Juan Soto, you can do that in the blink of an eye, but It just, it all depends. I'm all I'm trying to say, and I'll backpedal a little bit from what I just said is that I'm just, I'm more skeptical of trading somebody with those tools with Alejandro Kirk. I think Danny Jansen's safe. I agree with you, Mark. So I think when it really comes down to it, when they do have to address it, whether it's in July or if it's next winter, it'll be either Kirk or Moreno who go, because yes, you want to exploit your assets. You want to spread them out elsewhere. I think it's inevitable that the time comes. It's a good situation to have. Perhaps the Jays are trying to delay it as much as they can before they get to that point. But at the end of the day, they know they're going to get to that point. For me, I just right now, you look at the way he's playing, you look at the tools he has, you look at the power, you look at the no, the no chasing, like that's all you really want out of a player right now. So that's why for me, it would just be very tough to move him. But again, he's not untouchable. Like he's definitely going to be brought up in many trade discussions. I think that's pretty much certain. I just, I think that there should be more, I just think there should be some hesitancy of trading MLB talent compared to trading people in the minor leagues, but we'll see. It all depends on the market. It's going to shape up soon. We're getting closer to that point where names are starting to, I guess, or will begin to be floated out. I think a few guys that have already kind of been floated out, and this has pretty much been from Jeff Passan on um, all over, or I should say just on, I guess, radio shows like Blair and Barker. I mentioned you guys one time, Josh Bell's been mentioned. Another guy that also has been mentioned is a guy like Ian Happ. Those type of players are likely what they will be pursuing first. And of course, we know that relievers are going to be looking at too. Perhaps there's another name that we haven't heard of that's a lot bigger or a little bit bigger where you have to, I guess, consider moving big pieces like this. So it all depends. But for Kirk, I just, I would be hesitant moving him right now. That's all I'm saying. Again, my point stands. Either way, whoever you're moving and arguments being made on different sides by both of you, someone's getting moved. Agreed. There's just too much talent on the Blue Jays that I think, and I am willing to say, maybe not 100% certainty because there obviously are some caveats, but maybe 90% certainty, 85% certainty that someone, one of the catchers, Kirk or Marino, is getting moved by the trade deadline. Um and I'll stand by that. I might be wrong, but I'll stand by that. Um, okay, let's get some series predictions in before we wrap this episode up. A series against the Kansas City Royals should be relatively easy, hopefully, for the Blue Jays. What do you guys think? I'll kick it off because I'm kind of the... Uh, you always the do, mo- Jacob. Let's see I, it. I, well, I'm the most out of pocket when it comes to trades and, and just predictions in general. I'm going to say right now, a sweep. Sweep against the Kansas City Royals. This team, let's this team has 17 wins. You can like you can make four errors a game and you'll probably still win this series in terms of a sweep. I think you know the Royals do have some talent. I'm I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna shortcome on that, but I think 
you have Yusei Kikuchi, you have Ross Stripling, who's, you know, both of them have looked kind of good the last couple games. You have, uh, who's in the third game? I think so. You have Manoa, obviously, in the middle game. I wouldn't be surprised if the sweep, uh, especially considering this offense has been as good as it's been, I think a sweep is likely. I need to be careful. I need to correctly say what I predicted prior. Jacob, we both predicted. I can confirm without hesitating. We both said two out of three this past weekend. We were both wrong. So it's time to predict the same thing that you just predicted again. And let's hope that we get back on the win column. I'm predicting a sweep. Uh, You have Daniel Lynch on Monday for Kansas City. You have Brad Keller, I believe, on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, you have Brady Singer. All these guys have ERAs. I think the lowest ERA you have out of these guys are 415. The Kansas City Royals are a bad team who are rebuilding. You have Ross Stripling who takes over for Ryu for the time being. Like you mentioned, we know what we're going to get out of Ross Stripling. Hopefully it's five or six innings. You have Alec Manoa. We know Alec Manoa, Yusei Kikuchi, is in need of a bounce back start. There is no reason why they don't sweep this series. I am predicting a sweep after pretty much coming off their first loss or their first series loss in a few weeks. They're going to get back on track this week. The schedule definitely gets favorable for them, this road trip in particular. And also in the month of June coming up, I know it's not uh, the beginning of the homestand, but it's at the end of the next homestand. I don't want to go too far ahead, but all I'm saying is you have the Orioles coming up too. So you have some light games coming up. Take advantage of them like a team like the Yankees have been doing. Win games, sweep the Royals. I'm going to say two to three, and I don't really have a good reason for it. I'm just not confident in predicting a sweep. And I used to have, is it David Lynch or Daniel Lynch? Daniel Lynch. Okay. I used to have him on my fantasy team for a couple of weeks there. Come on. So I'll say for the sake of my former fantasy team, he has a good start and I'll say two to three. Um, no particular good reason though. So um, anyways, we'll wrap it up there. But before we do that, some listener responses to today's episode. The first being, from a guy who's given us a little bit of a hard time for, I guess, our inconsistency with uh, what we've done, saying, questioning whether the Blue Jays' offense will be back for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then instantly saying the Blue Jays are unbeatable. Um, which seriously, I, I anyways, um, talks ready 001 says, interesting, the offense is back, question mark. Uh, anyways, Alex Mercer saying concerned about Gosman, but overall not terrible, especially since the offense is still here. And E Titanic 12 saying disappointing should have been a series. We could have won, not Kevin's fault for obviously the game that took place today, which I think all of us agree with as we've talked about. So a little couple, bit of different thoughts going on there. And yeah, I think like it is disappointing bottom line, the Blue Jays didn't win the series, but it's not the end of the world. It's one series. Uh, the Blue Jays are going to bounce back and they have a lot of momentum going right now. And they certainly didn't lose at all with one series loss. But okay, three games against the Kansas City Royals. As always, you can support our podcast by finding us on social media. That's at Section 138 Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can support us by giving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We will catch you after this three game set against the Royals. Mm-hmm.